Columbus, did they have a ballroom in there? Yeah. And dance wood, hall. Darn, dance wood, hardwood floors yeah. and the stage. And dance hall. Yeah. I love those places. Mm -hmm. I lived in a, a what ballroom this article, in What this Boston. article is about is uh, there was a, a neighborhood contingent that didn't want to see the manor hall come tumbling down. Yeah. And, uh, but the only, the only thing that made sense for us when we, when we bought out our competitor and purchased this building was yeah. to put our building together with the building next door uh -huh. and tear down the manor hall so that we would have uh, a great street presence on the corner of 39th and Troost and we needed parking adjacent to our front door. Sure. So it made sense to tear it down. One of the caveats though was that when they built these buildings back then, they they built the this building onto this building and there's a common wall. And when we started tearing the manor hall down, they said, Stop, stop, that's a common wall. If they'd have torn this building down, this one would have come down with it. So we had to get a coring company to come and cut the building that we were keeping, cut that wall away, and then we put great big huh. threaded rod all the way through the building and bolted the building together across the Oh, top. no kidding. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I forgot. Yeah. That's why we need him. So, uh, <laughs> and, then, and then we cut openings in the upstairs so that the upstairs of this building would join the upstairs of this building. And we cut another passageway underneath. But uh, that, that was a big project in, in 1985. We bought out our competitor. This article, this was, oh, that was 85 also, but this was uh, 78, 79, 70, 64 eight. years. This was 78, this article, Dad. Mm -hmm. That's after we remodeled the front of the building. So, in 1977, there, it was the big flood, Brush mm. Creek flood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The plaza. Yeah. And we did a, a tremendous amount of business from that flood. Right. Because we did things from the stores. Like, because my mom worked at home, at Halls. At Halls. We and, did their stuff too. And some of it. She, but, uh, yeah, and, for the uh, salvage. She, I was living in Boston and she called me on the phone and she was telling me about all the cleanup that they had to go It was all awful. You never seen nothing like it. Yeah. And you know, there were, <clears throat> at that time, there were uh, several furriers on the plaza. Right, sure. There was Sylvan Tron that had a basement vault. Sylvan Tron furriers was. Um, I went to high near, school with Jerry Tron. Right, near yeah. where uh, um, Tibbles is now. Uh huh. And it was there in the middle of the block, and they had a basement fur vault, totally flooded. Wow. Uh, Swanson's had a basement fur yeah. vault. Gerhardt was flooded. around the corner. Gerhardt too. had a basement fur vault, yeah. all flooded. And a lot of those furs, if they were in good enough condition, were saved. Really? Yeah, they were, they were cleaned, they were totally taken apart, and re-oiled the skins and nailed them out. I don't know if Gerhardt did that many, yeah. but Tron, they did a lot of them yeah. for Tron. Alaskan we did a lot one. of them. Alaskan yeah. had a big Alaskan head. was on the other what side of the plaza. What year are you talking? 1977. September 1977. I remember it yeah. so well because I had gone to uh, the evening Rosh Hashanah service with my mom and my grandmother, and it rained and rained and rained and rained all through that service, and remember the rain was home. coming down, and I drove mom, we drove through Leewood. Home, and, and people couldn't go anywhere. Traffic was snarled everywhere, and I brought Grandma home to, to um, Willow Creek, mm -hmm. and then I couldn't go south on Warnell because the hundred, because uh, Indian Creek was flooded over and washing out that bridge, um, and I had to go around to get Mom home, and then I went home, and then three in the morning, I got a phone call from the guys at Wolf Brothers. You remember? Yeah, and we And then I called there. you. And I picked you up four in the morning, Dad, and I drove to the plaza, and all the powers that be at Wolf Brothers were standing in this mess, and the whole thing was full of basement was full of mud. They're they're downstairs mm -hmm. at Wolf Brothers. They had that uh, shop trendy. We were working here twenty four seven. Now <laughs> with mud and, on the floor. And they and made a the decision. Floor. They made a decision to try to clean everything. Yeah. And Harsh, um, Jack Henry said just let the salvager take it mm -hmm. and uh we worked for and we how, worked for some of the salvage people yeah. 
Oh yeah, we did. I saw work for the stacks salvages. of leather leather coats stacked up in a warehouse, and they had a big hose, and they were washing the mud off of them, and then hanging them up to dry, and then we would clean them. And then you'd oil them and clean them, yeah. clean them and refinish them. Hey, let me ask you this: Would you say that that flood marked the end of the the beginning of the end for the all of the Kansas City owned uh, retailers like Chasnoffs and? Wolf Brothers and Hartsfelds and Swans. I don't think, the flood, I I don't think, think the flood that. had anything to do with that part no. of it. Oh, okay. It just went. To, you see what happened to the plaza over these years. Oh yeah. You, the women can't find halls is the only place that you can get a uh, an expensive garment. There's nobody left. Saks was the last one. Well, it's all the, the there's no there's no local Kansas City companies. Anymore. Right now, I do some work for Ann Chasna, for instance. Uh, she has an occasional TV problem, and I go over and fix it for her and stuff. And I was with her daughter, Bar Barbara. Oh. And I were in the same class together. And we at Pem Day. She was like at Sunset or Barstow. We I'll tell you about Chasna. Dave Chasna. Chasnoff downtown was our first, my first customer. When I came out of uh, from overseas and came back in 1946, I went downtown and knocked on doors because my father was a quality tailor uh -huh. that started the business, and we knew some of the old tailors in the shop. So I went to Wolf Brothers, Hartsfeld, but Chasnoff was my first customer. Dave and Joe, and then I went across the street to Minlands. And we, we wow. did their work. And I just, we went to, ended up at Klein's, and every one of the stores we did all their work. All their cleaning work. All their cleaning. Any tailoring? No repairing, no. Okay. They had their own tailor shops. But they needed somebody that knew how to handle the stuff. <clears throat> I remember I used to go to Mr. Wolf's office and pick up his suits so they could be pressed right. Really? Now, yeah. is that Herb Wolf? Herb Wolf. Okay. What about Lighton? Alfred Lighton? <laughs> you want me to really tell you the story of Alfred Lighton? <laughs> yes. He was a spoiled brat nephew. A <laughs> <coughs> Mr. Wolf. Huh? A Mr. Uh, Mr. Wolf. Mrs. Lighton was his sister. Was Alfred's, Alfred's mother was uh, Herb Wolf's sister. And, Al and Mr. Wolf had no children. <clears throat> so they left everything to Alfred, and uh, you know he got shot. Yeah, I remember. You know, he and Bob Slegman, that whole story yeah. about Slegman, Stern, Slegman, and Prince. We did all their cleaning too. I had the opportunity about six years ago to do eight hours with Bob Slegman mm -hmm. on video. Didn't yeah. he just pass away? Did he? I, oh Bob? yes, yes. Yeah. I haven't been paying attention. Yeah. We did another one of Bob Slegman. Yeah. Yes. Well, you, Gary, did it. It was one. outstanding. Yeah. Really outstanding. He was one of the first manufacturers, and then Youth Lewis Walters, then Youth Craft, then Fashion Built, and uh, Rice Coat, and you can. Is Betty Rose? Coat, Loretta Rice. Yeah, that's her husband. Uh, okay. Can't think Dale. Of Dale Rice, that's his Dale's mother. Friend. That oh. was his mother. No, are you, uh, you're about Dale's contemporary, aren't you? Dale's a little older than me. Is he? He's a few okay. years older than me. Well, what year did you graduate high school? 73. Oh, okay. So he's much older than you. He's more like 65. All right, well, he's 10 oh, years old. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because he was a few years ahead of me at Penn Day. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, you know, uh, you, you mentioned the Taylors, and... I, I meant to tell you this. There, there was an article in the, in the October National Clothesline, Dry Cleanings, American Roots Revealed. For years, the story's been told about that the dry cleaning industry began in France, where uh, a tailor, Jolly Belin, spilled a uh, paraffin lamp onto a greasy tablecloth, and when it dried, the spots were gone. And that was the discovery of dry cleaning. But it has now been revealed that an African-American tailor from New York actually invented and patented dry cleaning before this happened. And in this article, I just read this article, and it's, it's fabulous. Save it, it is. But, but it's, uh, it, it traces the roots of dry cleaning. Uh, and this, um, this African-American tailor uh, named, um, it's, it's in here, Jennings. 
Uh, yeah, Thomas L. Jennings received a patent for his dry cleaning process in 1821, according to the U.S. Patent Office. Jennings' process, which he called dry scouring, is likely the first U.S. patent awarded to an African American. And he was a tailor in New York City, and he and he experimented with a bunch of different ways to to clean clothes because back then everything had to be washed, and there were a lot of stains and things that wouldn't come out with water because they were solvent soluble and he worked on methods to save these clothes because they were all expensive rolls and you know beautiful fabrics and they would dye them if they couldn't get the stains out well he wanted to find out how to save them without having to dye them and it is a, it's a great article it but, certainly uh, is yeah Jennings was born in New York in 1791 young man he was among volunteers who aided in digging trenches in Long Island uh, during, World, during the War of 1812, later working as a clothier and tailor in New York, he attracted a strong following of customers. Yeah, and, uh, and however, he found that many of his customers were dismayed when their garments became soiled because the material used were unable to use conventional means to clean them. Thus, people would either continue to wear the clothes in their soiled condition or simply discard them. And, and then he... Um, uh, so, so now they're claiming. That's a heck of an artist. Now they're claiming that that Jolly Berlin, a French tailor, did not invent dry cleaning in the in the 1840s. <laughs> Thank you very yeah. very much. I get all my reading done on airplanes. Oh, good. <laughs> Keep doing it, yeah. will you please? <laughs> yeah. Because you're putting these things together. Right. Yes, and connecting all kinds of events. Well, you know, we started as a tailor shop, arrow cleaners and tailors. But the dry cleaning wasn't done on the premises. There were big wholesale outfits that did the dry cleaning for the tailors and then dropped the clothes back and the tailors would press them and put the orders back together. Midwest, Midwest Wholesale Cleaners owned by Saul Silver. You remember Saul Silver? I know the name. Do you know uh, Pactor? Yes, which one? Uh, Julius is Pactor's son, married uh, is that Meyer Pactor? Meyer's brother. Oh, Julius okay. is Meyer's brother. But the son, what's his name, married to? Billy. Billy Pactor married. Let me get the, I got to get this straight. Uh, Sherry Weinberg. No, no. Uh, Saul Silberg's daughter. Oh. And that's Myron Wang's wife. Ex wife. Oh. Marcia? Marcia. Really? <laughs> yeah. The, and, uh, the Saul, therapist. Saul Silberg. <laughs> Uh, was uh, had a wholesale cleaners where the, uh, he'd come by dad's store get out of the truck and take a bag full of clothes that were marked in clean them and then bring them back to him and we would press them and then, I love it then, I love it then, I love all these connections what about he just said paraffin wax yes. all over it no par paraffin oil well paraffin was... oil or wax that everybody would say how am I going to get that out? Well, it's probably the easiest thing to get out in the world because it flushes out in dry cleaning. It's all in the The last thing at the fractionating tower when they make gasoline from crude oil, uh -huh. the last thing at the bottom is paraffin wax. Really? You know how I know that? Yeah. My brother was a chemical engineer. <laughs> and he was in the business and showed he, originally, and he showed us a lot of things. And uh, after about a year, I bought him out in about 1947 or 48. Now, your, bro your brother was a chemical engineer? Mel. Mm -hmm. Here? Yeah. I don't think I knew Well, he married Sarah Mae Galler. I don't know whether you know that name. I don't think you would. But he would be old. He'd be uh, your husband's age. 91. Well, no, Mel would have been Mel. 93. He's 10 years older than me. Oh, okay. And he was a genius. I mean an absolute genius. He could do anything with his hands and anything with his mind. He was wonderful. He could even make lemon pie for me that was delicious. <laughs> That's the I'm kind of guy he was. <laughs> well, he took care of his wife for years. 45 years for he Sarah, took care Sarah. of his wife. She, was, she had migraine headaches and they gave her so many pills for pain that it ruined her kidneys. Mm. And she ended up with cancer of the kidneys and 
she died. She was on dialysis for years. Yeah. And kidney failure. Well, then they. Uh, All right. Now, who was this? This is my brother Mel, my youngest brother. He was married to Millie Abrams. Did you know Millie? Okay. Well, they well, were married you know twenty Kathy years. You know Kathy and Mike Schultz. What about Mike Schultz? Kathy, his yes. wife, her mother. Millie was married to Mel. But she was married three times. Mel was her third husband. Sure, she was a doll. And Millie was a doll. Mm -hmm. Just, but, but uh, Sarah May, Mel's first wife, was the most beautiful lady you would ever want to see in in this world, and built like a, a model. And she, who was, who did she work for? As secretary, Rabbi Haddis. You knew Rabbi Haddis, of course. So she worked for him, and uh, she went to Central, and Mel went to Westport. This is such wonderful information. <laughs> but you're you're from I'm from Michigan. But we've been here a long time. What part of Michigan? Bay City. Oh, oh my god, god. you don't need to tell me friends is then from Bay Yes, I know all yeah, the Mark, Kathy, Mark, Jeff, 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 I just talked yes, I yes. just talked to Mark <laughs> and Judy. We're we're still close friends. Really? Yeah, now I remember. Oh god, what a network. Yeah, well, what it's six degrees of separation. <laughs> you can put everybody together. Everybody. We call this Jewish geography. I know. I'm married to a Jew, so I, I actually am learning by osmosis over the last. Tomorrow's our 26th anniversary, by oh, the way. Oh, congratulations. Congratulations. Are we going to have a party? No, no. <laughs> no, we we're had our party last year. Five years, and we're not going to have a party. You're either. five years longer than me. Five years longer? Mm -hmm. so we had celebrated our 60th in June. All right, now, now hold on a minute. From the old dry cleaning store. <laughs> yeah. Hold on a minute. Let me ask you a second. I, no. I was wondering if you could move a little bit closer sure. to your father. Sure, that's all. Okay, okay. great, thank you. Okay. okay, all this memory began with this. Okay. This was a uh, an event at the Yeshiva University Museum in New York City. The curator of that museum, his name is Gabriel, Gabriel Goldstein, put this all together. His uh, boss at the time was Sylvia Herskowitz. She has now retired. Okay, Kansas City was going to get this exhibit, mm -hmm. and uh, the person who wanted it the most was Pete Levy. Mm -hmm. Because his father was in the garment business. Now, did you is he the lawyer, or she's the lawyer? Pete, that Pete is the um, chamber of Cha uh, chairman of the chamber of commerce. Okay, yeah, I, I know him, but <laughs> I didn't know. Him. But he, he's our customer. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's there's a Levy that's our cu that's a lady that's a lawyer's our customer. Yeah, I don't know. Who you're talking? About. All right, now. I did not bring this e exhibit here, even though he wanted it. It was too fragile, and the people at the Union Station weren't that eager for it. Really? And yeah. it's too difficult to do an exhibit if everybody is not eager for it. Right. If there are too many things that go wrong. Yeah. It never left Can uh, New York, ever. All right, in the meantime, I knew they were going to do another book. They're doing one multi-author book on the um, garment centers of the United States. Kansas City was not included. Really? They never heard that Kansas City ever had a garment. They were the. Uh, someone told me at one time we were the third largest, second, second, second largest yes. coat. Per, uh, yes. garment producer. Yes. Yeah. And they never heard of Kansas City. Never heard of Kansas City. Never. Well, we're, we're west of the Appalachians. Is That's that why. what it is? Yeah. Okay. They don't know that there's anything west of the but Appalachians. But by that time, I had gotten a business plan and a statement of purpose and so on. Send it to Texas Tech Publishers. That's who did this and that's who's going to do the multi-author book. Okay. They were delighted to have us and stopped the presses. 
and waited for our essay to be done. Then I had to find a scholar to do the essay. And she is from the University of Missouri at Columbia. Okay. Okay. Now, they are still waiting for our manuscript and all the others at Texas Tech. Okay. Because of the Madoff problem, Yeshiva University was caught in that. Mm. And they had to leave a great number of their staff, they had to let them go, so on and so on. Mm. They never in Texas got these manuscripts. Well, this now, the next part of the story, it will blow you away. We had a temporary historian working in Kansas City to get all of these interviews and all of this information. We went back into the city directories and got all those names and followed them all up and so on. She finally had to graduate. She was here going to the university. Her grandfather was Jim Olson, who was the president of the university and the, what do you call them, of, of the whole Missouri system. Chancellor. Mm. And he brought the, um, he brought the archive system to Kansas City from Columbia, Missouri. And that's where we were sending all of our material. It's called the Western Historic Manuscript Collection. <clears throat> However, the things that we collected were going to Columbia. And they could come back, but not, not very fast. And it did slow things down. Okay, let's go to Jessica again. Jessica was working with the, great, with the Western Historic manuscript collection and his name is David Boutros and he gave her all the time she wanted or needed. He felt obligated to her. She was the boss's daughter. Jessica graduated. She went to Germany. Her topic uh, for her master's degree was the cabaret system, the cabaret music, not John Kander's cabaret, but the German cabaret period. She studied that. She was also going to get married in Germany or with someone who was in Germany with her. They decided not to get married. She came back to the United States. She needed a job. She knows how to edit manuscripts. She went over to Yeshiva Museum. She is editing all of those manuscripts and sending them to Texas Tech. Really? That now, a, if that isn't in that wild? a magical story, and she is thrilled, she is brilliant, I have to send her a check Tomorrow, <laughs> there is more money in the Western Historic Manuscript Collection that we have left there from raising money for this whole thing, part of it from Patty Chasnam. I mean, this whole thing is so connected. Well, Jessica is getting this done. It will be published. All right, next step. There will be a conference in May in Kansas City of the uh, National Costume Society of America. It will be at Crown Center. They want all this stuff as part of that program. Mm -hmm. The head honcho is at the junior college which one is it? Um, 
Johnson County? Can no, 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 no. In, in Missouri. Penn Valley? Long Penn Valley, Valley. Penn thank Valley. you. She <coughs> is a designer, or was a designer. She is bringing that conference here. Hmm. She is a very savvy lady, and she's on our board of advisors. Well, um... <laughs> There's so much to tell you, like, I have to stop. But um, I got a, an email. I must from move out just a minute and you do something. <laughs> no, no. I forgot to take my pills this morning. Uh oh. Okay. You um, need a water, Dad? <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> Where's water back here? Yeah, that's right. I forgot. It, there's a little fridge right to your Do I left. Get one too? Sure. sure. Uh, you want? Would you like a water? Yes, a bottled I water? I, th I think there's several in there. Okay. One, Damn, forget the goddamn two. pills. I know. Perfect. And you Perfect. have to take them a certain kind. I, I got to fill that back up. I'm gonna go get my. I'm gonna go get my. Get my little coffee up here. Gracias, like senor. De nada. <clears throat> I didn't open yours for you, I apologize. I needed it, I'll tell you. <clears throat> Dad had to call a timeout. Sorry, I'm not very hospitable. I offered you're you coffee, but I didn't offer you water. Um, are these your notes about the history you're going to talk about? This, some of the, th I, I just made up, just things that came in my head from when my grandfather, uh, my what my grandfather was mm -hmm. in Europe. And oh, my okay. dad. Cool. So whenever we're ready for that part of it, just let me know. I got it all written down. Good. And Bruce is going to edit some of it because he remembers dates. I don't. <laughs> okay. We'll get it done. Well, it's going to take more than one of these sessions. Oh, I'd have to say. Oh yes. And uh, Laura wants to be. Definitely wants to be part of it. Who is this? Debbie Toppy. Did you give me that name? Eight eight five seven 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 two. I wrote it up here for some reason. That wasn't the uh, model, was it? I don't know what I put here. Kansas City Tribune or something. I don't know. Oh no no no, Dad. Built. That's that's the gal that wrote the article on us in the Kansas City Tribune. It's an online deal. Oh okay. I knew I wrote it. It's down on our website. Something. Okay. I knew we have a lot of news and and things on our website. Not. Um, not a ton of history, but some history. How did you get convinced to stay in this business? Oh, how did I get convinced? Uh, you know, it was all by accident. I, you know, I, I um, worked around the business growing up. When I was a little kid, I remember coming down here and ironing gloves and gluing hems and leather, you know, coats and... Uh, uh, I swept the floor on Saturdays from about age 10 or 12, uh, you know, and then in the summers when I got my driver's license, I would run the route, you know, for vacation uh, for my Uncle Mort and, you know, just, um, well, he graduated from high school, he was 18, and he says, I want to be a bum for a year. Oh, I did not. I, I, I moved out to Vail for the summer. He when wanted to be a bum to go up and ski. He didn't want to go I was, to I was, bum. I was enrolled to go to KU. And I was all enrolled. Uh, but I spent the summer in Vail and worked construction, worked on the mountain, did you know a couple different things. And, and everybody talked about the ski season. And that's all they talked about. And they, uh, we, went, we went glacier skiing one time during uh -huh. that summer. And then guys were coming uh, late in the summer uh, to start, you know, lining up to uh, try out for ski school and, and the ski patrol. And all, you know, all everybody talked about was the ski season. And I, I called Dad. I said, see if you can get your deposits back because I think I want to stay the ski season. And I'll go to school when I, you know, I want to stay the ski season and, and be a ski bum. And, uh, this was after the draft had been eliminated. Yeah, but it, right I, don't know, after I don't know how much you remember about the summer of 73, but it was when they rationed gasoline. Oh, that do was... you remember that? I sure do. And, and in the first the, oil embargo. When I wanted to drive back to Kansas City, I would park my little VW at the filling station uh, next to the Vail Village Inn 
at two in the morning and wait and I'd sleep in my car so uh -huh. I could be in first in line to get gasoline and get on the road the, the, the next morning. Amazing. Yeah, it was crazy. It was it was so much fun and then I stayed the ski season and I worked a couple jobs and then I got a uh, a job as a short order cook in a Mexican restaurant for the ski season and I had to go to work at 3.30 or they closed the lifts at 3, 3.30. Mm -hmm. So we would ski all day and I'd ski into work and change my clothes and cook and and we cleaned up the kitchen about 10:30, 11 o'clock, and then we'd go down and watch ski movies and go, you know, the bars, and and then get up the next morning and go ski again. So tell and us so how it was you fun. Got, you so, got so anyway, in in, fe in late February, well, mid February, Dad calls me and said, he says, I think you've had enough fun. Your uncle's retiring. I need you to come home and help me. So, packed up, came home. And um, this was uh, February, my first day at work. Doesn't everybody remember their anniversary dates of when yeah, they came to work at sure. a company? Most people do. Yeah. February 19th of 1974. And I was still 18. Mm -hmm. And I started learning the route. And, um, you know, my, my, uh, my dad's brother-in-law, my uncle, uh, ran the routes for years. And... When you and say ran the routes, you mean doing pickups and deliveries? Pick up and delivery of people's homes, which is in in now in two thousand and nine and you know, maybe five years prior, uh, this has been all the rage in the dry cleaning industry is you have to be in pickup and delivery. Right. We've been in it forever. I mean it's all I've ever known. And uh, and we stayed in it for a number of reasons, but you know, that's kind of you know, strategic planning of, mm -hmm. of the business as, as it grew. Uh, but I learned the routes and, um, and it was a great education for me because it was an opportunity to listen to the customers. And if, if you want to have a great business, you have to listen to your customers. Right. And so um, uh, we started, you know, building the business and I was out on the truck and not bashful to talk to customers. and. Uh, you know, I Dad always said, you know, Arrow had a great reputation, a great name, and he knew people. And you know, I, you know, would introduce myself. And uh, we were in the suede leather cleaning business, but mostly on the retail side. Mm -hmm. And our biggest competitor was Wardrobe Service Company, and they were on the wholesale side to the dry cleaners. And so we started soliciting the dry cleaners. We were originally partners. Yeah. Yeah. Danny Weinberg and I were original partners mm -hmm. in the suede and leather business, and uh, and uh, um, I met a man at Wolf Brothers by the name of Scully, and Mr. Scully was from California that sold him suede jackets, and there were just a few suede jackets at that time, and I met him and talked to him. I was down there, and uh, Is that in the fifties? God, I don't know. It's been so long ago. Anyhow. <clears throat> I talked to him about doing the suede and leather. I ended up going to California with Danny Weinberg and a man by the name of C.K. Kirkpatrick, an old man, used to clean suede and he taught us how to do it, which wasn't the right way. Because over the years we did better and better, just like dry cleaning has been better and better and better. And uh, that's how we got into the suede and leather business and then he'll finish when uh, Hmm. After after Danny and I decided to separate, I took the retail and he took the wholesale. And the wholesale is where he traveled all around the country and pick up cleaning from other cleaners. And uh, retail? Yeah. Retail is like uh, you call me up and we pick it up at your house. Or, or, or I'd go to the, Wolf Brothers, I'd go to Hartsfeld the, and we'd do the, their work for them. For the retail. We're going to do Wolf Brothers also. Oh, We're going to do a, uh, a story about them. Um, Where's Robert? Robert's in New York. Robert Alfred's was home for a couple of funerals. He was here for Tom Levitt's yeah. funeral. Uh, Who's? Tom he Levitt. Wonderful. Oh yeah, that was terrible. Yeah. Right? Tom Levitt. Tom Levitt, passing away. I tell you, it was worse. It was Allman. Oh, John Allman. Oh my God. That was the worst. He killed himself. They tell me that Trish now. My cousin is trying to help her because she needs a psychiatrist. She is so broken up. Broken up and so 
uh, depressed, really depressed, and uh, and she was a very private person. I understand. You know, all these stories tie into each other. I didn't know Ullman that well, and she, I, did. I was well. His younger brother Robert and I were classmates. Together. Anyhow. I didn't know this, but at 82nd and Knoll is where they live. Yeah. And Dr. Stotts, my original, one of my original customers, lived there in that house. In that they house. sold that house to Ullman. Now, how would I remember that? <laughs> Dr. Stotts, I'll You've never You've got to remember it because yeah. all this history is he was getting a, lost. He was a pediatric surgeon. I'll never forget. He died. I don't know where she went, but <laughs> it's unbelievable. I says. That's where they live. I says I used to deliver cleaning there. <laughs> Go ahead. I go by there every day. Now. Yeah. Uh, I have to say I'm going to interject one thing. This is a, a good reason why no one should have handguns, because when you get depressed and you don't, everything looks bleak. It's too easy to reach for it. And John. See, he Blue was in the car and she shot him. She saw him shoot himself. Mm. And you remember Elliot? Elliot. Jacobson did the same thing do 20, I do 20 sure. years ago. I know his brother, uh, his brother and I are the same age. <laughs> Herb? Yeah. Yeah, sure. We Al see, that. I see him. Alan Cosner did the same thing. Yeah. Who? Alan Cosner. Cosner, you know, Mel Cosner's son. Alan Cosner. <laughs> You know, you the, know the whole I'm afraid to comment on it because it'll take us another direction. Yeah, it is. A, it is. What, what do they call that? Uh, a, a separate tangent. Yeah. yeah. Let's well, get I back don't know to much the about it, dry cleaning. Uh, no. <laughs> Anyhow, no. Bruce came back and started running the routes. Right. And I, we used to have. Uh, uh, I used to go downtown, and my brother-in-law used to run the south routes. Well, when Bruce, you guys were doing the pickup and delivery yourself. Oh, yo, sure. Even though you own well. the company. <laughs> Listen, you didn't have somebody I know, doing the cleaners ever... today that I call yeah. and I says, "Can I talk to Bill?" Well, he's out on the route. He'll be back <laughs> at noon. Uh, he's the owner. He's the dry cleaner. He runs his own routes. I mean, that's a small company. I mean, yeah. you know, when I came but in you in seventy four, you have to talk to the customer. So but, isn't that what he's doing? Yeah. Let me, right. let me just explain to you. When I came out of the service, they, my brother and my dad started fixing this building up for dry cleaning. Mm -hmm. We had a mortgage of 635, 600000 no, $635. We had a mortgage to build the upstairs apartments. And we had a piece of junk downstairs. It was a mess. The place was a mess. I, I used to work 18 hours a day piping in pipes to hook up our press machines. Mm. And it was just a mess. I had about six or seven employees. But I used to go downtown, and my brother-in-law used to go south. We didn't have any money. I made $25 a week and $34 from the government on the job training. Mm. Then when Bruce came back, he was running downtown and south. He was doing both routes. And we just worked a lot of hours. Uh, didn't mean nothing. I used to come in at uh, night and uh, work uh, till uh, 10, 30, 11 o'clock to get the work done. i tell you a funny story. You'll love this story. Had a guy working there, a black guy that I knew very well. A kid, young kid, he was a good presser. So I went home about uh, 10:30, and he was still working here. And uh, the phone rings about uh, 10, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock. He says, "Bob, he's there's a pansy in here." I says, "A what?" He says, "There's a pansy running around in here." I said, "What's a pansy?" He says, "You know what a pansy is, don't you?" I says, "I'll be right down." So I drove from 75th and State Line up here. When I came in, it was a spider monkey that big. Oh. And you ever seen a spider monkey? No. Where'd it come from is my question. We didn't know. It must have been a personal <laughs> thing. Uh -huh. And we had windows up here. We got in through the window. And if you know a spider monkey, they're filthy. Are they? He defecated all over everywhere. Oh, no. So finally we got a, a gunny sack. Uh -huh. Got that little bastard in there. <laughs> tied it up. <laughs> we had somebody take it out to the zoo. That's one of the funny stories. And how many stories have we fixed our boiler and I had the boiler blow up in my face one day, blew me out the door, 
Oh, and we had God. such beautiful. Wait a minute. And then when the weather was cold, the <laughs> gas company would call up and say, "You got to shut the gas off and go on oil standby." Well, oil standby, you could have bought a automatic. But did you have money for an automatic? I didn't. So we used to sit at night, my man who was with me for 36 years, to adjust this steam and oil in to atomize the the fuel oh, in. Right. It would, and it used to go like this. <laughs> well, I was afraid the damn thing was going to blow up. <laughs> So we had to sit and do that. They'd tell us to shut off the gas because we couldn't, they didn't have enough gas. Oh, okay. So it, it just, there's so many stories I could tell you. We that, want them all. That, that when, you, when you're in business and you want to make it go, you better work. Right. He used to come back at night and work. I got in the hat business. Years Cleaning ago, hat. we made hats, cleaned them and made them. So you were also a manufacturer. Yes, well, we I bought this business called Quality Hat Works. Campbell's. Campbell's, that is. Campbell's Quality Hat Works. Yeah, anyhow. What what year was that, Dan? Oh, God, please, I don't know. <laughs> well, well, I remember. We need to be, know. Do you know, Bruce? I remember coming in the place, and we had on all, the, all the hat equipment. No, it was right downstairs. Yeah, but we bought it. It was on 39th right, Street. Right. We moved it over and, here. And uh, all the hat equipment, and we had the old balcony, and yeah. all the hat equipment was on the balcony. So I bought that, that had to be like late 50s, early 60s. Anyhow, bought we that. bought the business for $10,000. And we made hats for uh, Jack straw Henry, hats. We made Wolf for, uh, for individuals. And we cleaned hats for other cleaners. And Bruce used to block them and clean them. Uh, we used to clean them and he used to block them. And uh, I had this hatter that knew how to make the hats. But I, when I bought the business, I didn't ask one question. Was the hatter a drunk? He was. <laughs> so I had a hat business with a drunk, and we didn't know how to do it. So we, there was another hat works called Cat's Hat Works, and mm -hmm. we used to have him do the work. Go ahead. Louie. 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 Louie and uh, Benny Katz. Do you remember those names? No. I, I do, but what I'm impressed with is that whenever things went wrong or went the wrong way and so on, you invented another way to adapt to it. No, and that's no. the secret of success. We it's also we did some things that we weren't smart enough because we were all hard workers and not smart. It's the we, e-myth. We, we, uh, we invented a press machine pad. We had a spotter here that was a drunk but was the finest spotter I ever and I learned everything from him. And we invented, with my brother knowing what's going on, we invented a press pad on the press machine. Uh -huh. They used to use just heavy cotton, and it used to get hard as a rock. So they invented taking a piece of uh, asbestos mm -hmm. material, a piece of glass, uh, like fiberglass, fiberglass yeah. and a piece of sponge rubber like this, and with a cover on it, and put it on the press, and it worked wonderful. And so my brother got together with a guy with some money to back us. We didn't have any money. So it built up and built up, and eventually this guy with the money what? stuck it to us. He took it all. Yeah, he got well, the patent in his, yeah. the patent. Uh, I still have the patent documents. Still, uh, anyhow, my my brother, would, he finally uh, sued this guy and got a little bit of money out of him. Sidney Schultz, you remember the name? Oh, very well. Yeah, well, he, oh. he was the crook that screwed us. Oh, hey, yeah. look who's here. Here okay. he is with my oh, savior. Hey. Norman, you have missed the Norman, most did you really make all stories. those stairs? Did you get up all those stairs? Yeah, except for the railing. I mean. <laughs> Sit down and enjoy yourself. Where are you? What did I miss? Oh, oh just some history and stories that we went through. But they're all on tape. Probably, uh, Norman, stories that you went through when you were young, too. When you, when you went into business. Uh, I just. Go ahead, just I, so this. I, <laughs> I could talk forever. <laughs> look, Dad, look at this. U.S. Patent Office, 1949. Melvin Gershon, a signer, Arrow Manufacturing Company, Kansas City. This was for the press pad. This is the original oh. drawings. 
Isn't that neat? Can you hold those up for the camera, Bruce? These. They they still they still produce this. Nice. I mean, Here. this basic press pad is still produced. This is on the sofa. It, it's called uh, Qualitex. Qualitex, and there's a couple others that, they, with the patent gone after 17 years, they could do anybody could do what they wanted to do. Yeah, but they can't use years. asbestos anymore. Right. No, that's right. that's gone. Yeah, they, they've substituted Nomex. Nomex. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. That's the uh, it was one of the inventions material. that we made right. here, uh, and we didn't have any money, so we had to get somebody with some money oh, to yeah. help uh, make the thing and sell it. Sidney Schultz, remember that? Not very well. Well, he screwed us out of it, is what he did. Well, he was not a good business. He was man. not a good man, even. No, he was not a good man. That's one story. And the second story is... I knew Sidney Schultz. You know what a hand iron is, don't you? Yes. You know what a steam iron is? Yes. Yeah. Okay, a steam iron in a cleaners yeah. is piping real steam in, and there was a treadle that you pushed yes. down and pushed a valve down up here and let steam in. So one day, my brother was talking to me about it. I says, you know, Mel, when I was in the Air Force, when we worked on B-29s, there was a switch in there that before you started the engines, you flipped this switch and it, gasoline went into the oil to loosen it up so you could start the engines. Mm -hmm. So I, I says, you know what? Couldn't we use that uh, valve and just put a button on the iron and for a steam iron? Well, we did it. We made That's it. We put I a mean. doorbell button on it, and we had the valve because he knew all about that. But somebody else saw it in our shop, and they went ahead, and a company by the name of Sissel, big, enormous company, came out with the thing. We didn't patent it. We didn't know nothing. But you know what? I got them all beat. I'm still alive, <laughs> and they're all dead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Including Sidney Schultz. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Big Buick, I think he yeah. had. Yeah, you know him. I knew him. His dad was in the dry cleaning business years ago. Oh, that I did. Criterion Cleaners yes, was the I name did. of it. I knew that. Yeah. I forgot his first name, the old man Schultz. They were on wine. You remember the Playmore? Yeah. Right behind the Playmore is where their place yes, was. Yes, definitely. Definitely. But I that's two it. that's two things that I could have been a, a multimillionaire. But you are. But I am. <laughs> I'm alive. And your business is thriving. Yes, it's, we're plenty of fortunate. And but that's him. He's he's made this business one of the And more important, you have a good name. You yeah. take care of my good yes, coat. Yes, a good name. I got it in the mud. In a hurry. In 24 hours. In a hurry. 12 hours, one day. <laughs> well, I haven't do known you, you very long, Do you want a long, copy Norman. of... How long have I known you guys? You I want get, a copy of this pattern? <laughs> you know, he lived right here at 37th Street. You want a copy of truth. this patent? 646 <clears throat> next to the Cleveland Chiropractic Clinic. Yes, right next door. Yes. Another Norman, I can't. There's, I want to show copies of the patent. Here, a telephone yeah. book, 1926. <clears throat> Sam's name's in there and his address and telephone Sam number. Sam Kahn? Yeah. yeah. That was your uncle? My, my, yes. My father's brother. Yes. The older brother. But somebody gave that to us. They found it. And somebody gave that to us. And I go through it and see all the old names, all the old tailors. And Connors of 3646 Truce. Yeah. And her name was Sarah. Uh, yes. I just looked at it this morning. All the cons are in there about this many. Sarah of them. is uh, uh, Gilbert's. Is mother. Rose in there? His mother. Yeah. Rose. Uh, is Rose in here? No. I don't know. No, Rose would not be. And you, but when you open head. that up, you want to be careful. It's so old, it's falling apart. I don't want to open it. But uh, who, what was Gilbert's sister's name? He talks about her like she was Rose. a tyrant. She was. Rose. She was. She drove the whole business. Uh huh. Yeah. He said she, she was a tyrant. That's a good word. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and the only one who escaped was uh, uh, the one who went to Chicago, made big time. Earl. 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 PhD. Yes. Yeah. Earl was the one that left, yeah, lived in Scottsdale good. that left Gilbert and the kids all that, what he had. Yes. Substantial. And, and he took a lot of, he, they, didn't he give a lot of stuff to the museum down in? Yes, he did. Yeah. What Gilbert, museum? Uh, Earl, in Scottsdale? Earl uh -huh. had the uh, Ph.D. and instead of being a teacher, philosopher, writer, he became an advisor to businesses mm. way back then. Had Ford and 
DuPont big company. Well, he must have been a brilliant man because everything I hear about him. Yes. It was all true. Yeah. Except he never married. <laughs> what? He never married. Well, There's one in every family. <laughs> <laughs> I sat one next to one last night on the steps. She never married. Who was that? On never what steps? Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, um, uh, uh, to digress and where we started this whole deal was my uh, my dad came from Poland, a little town right out of Warsaw, Blenda, and his father was a tailor and his brother and he were tailors and they tell me the story that when they made the suits for Christmas or, the, or rather the Jewish holidays after the holidays were over they brought all the suits back because all the buttons fell off so they had to resew all the buttons back on. This is a, a true story. Why and now the, I'm missing the, the point. Yeah, why well, the buttons fall off? Because they didn't sew them on good. They did them in a hurry. Oh, thank you very much. It's, that's kind of a joke, you know. <laughs> Sounds like the Chinese New Year. Now my my dad's parents was Anna and Max, and my dad was born in 1888 when my he dad came. Was born in 1888 mm -hmm. from Vilna. Yeah, well, Dad was from Blendeth, a little town. So when Dad came to New York, came through Ellis Island, he came to New York, he went to work for a pants manufacturer. I don't know the name of the pants manufacturer. In but New York? Yeah, that was 1901, because he was in his 20s. And uh, after he uh, stayed there, uh, two brothers, uh, in 88, 01, he'd have been 13 years old. Well, uh, in 1888, and I put added 21 to it. You know, I made a, uh, yeah, what? I don't know. 1888, and you added 21. <coughs> it's 1901, isn't it? No. 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 Nine? Oh, nine. 1909. Nine, 1909. I'm sorry, 1909. Yeah, that makes more sense. Check your math. Yeah, well. <laughs> Know your history and check your math. He came here in 1914 and to Kansas City, and I don't know how he got here. And he he married my mother, who came from Romania, and she had two sisters. And his brother-in-law, my uncle, my uncle, used to sell shirts down on Ninth and Main to all the attorneys. And when my dad wanted to call it Gershon Taylor's. He says, no, you can't do that. He says, that's not good. He says, let's pick up an important name. So my uncle was selling Arrow shirts at the time, and that's where the name came from, Arrow shirts. So it was Arrow cleaners and tailors, then it was Arrow cleaners and dyers, and then what do we go from there? Well, our, our corporate name is still Arrow cleaners and dyers incorporated. <clears throat> but nobody ever spelled dyers right, and we quit handling <laughs> We quit handling textile dye work a long time ago. So in, in 1985, after we bought out our competitor, Ram Leather Care Wardrobe Service, an Acme Cleansing Company, and I put it all together, I hired Ann Willoughby and Associates to do a new logo for us. And I wanted to change the name to encompass what we, what we did. And so we called it Aero Fabric Care Services. So the DBA, one of, one of many DBAs is Aero Fabric Care Services. And then our leather division, because when I'd go to New York and solicit for leather cleaning to the manufacturers, I called it Aero Leather Care Services. So Fabric Care, Leather Care, uh, we still go by Aero Cleaners for a lot of people. In 1945. I have all the URLs. In 1945. My brother and my dad opened the place up here at 3838 Truce. Dad started at 4301 Truce. During the Second World That's War, when it first started, uh, the people bought the building that my dad was in, so we moved him. they moved him across the street to 4254 Truce. And then in 45, they came up here. And then in 46, I came back from the Army and started working at it. And my didn't didn't Grandpa and Uncle Mel pool their money to buy this building? Right. How much did they pay for this building? Ten thousand dollars. 
1945. Yeah, and they took the boiler out of the basement and sold it for $1,500. <laughs> so they needed that money. And uh, took the boiler out of the basement where? Here. Here. There was a basement, a basement and the, there was a boiler down there. In, a heating in the, boiler. In the little basement? Yes. The boiler was bigger in the basement. Anyhow, that's what Mel told me because I was, well, wasn't had, here. How'd they get it out? I don't even know. Anyhow, uh, in 1945 we opened up up here and my dad and brother, I told you that, 1946 I came back and in 1948 I bought my brother out because my dad and me and my brother couldn't afford three salaries. We didn't have enough money in the business. Well, and Mel was a, an engineer. He, yeah, he, he was, was an engineer, graduate engineer from KU and so he went on his own. What did he do? Uh, he had a, he called it Gershon Engineering Company. That wasn't uh, immediately that day. He he went to work for some people. No. Uh -uh. No, he worked for he worked for them before that. Yeah, he worked for Floor and he worked for uh, an engineering well, company. When was he in the foam rubber business? Afterwards, after he left here. Right. Yeah, but originally, in 1941, I think it was that after he, I mean after 1945. He was working for a company we called Floor, and 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 uh, God, what's the other name? Another engineering company, and they sent my brother Mel to Oak Ridge, Tennessee, to work on the atomic bomb. Oh. So he was a, a he graduated a chemical engineer, but he did everything. Well, he was a mechanical engineer too. Well, he was he never had a degree, only in chemical. But he was a mechanical. He was everything. Anything you wanted to know, he knew how to do it. He was he was a brilliant guy, and not only that, very seldom do you find guys that are real mental, brilliant, that can use their hands. Mm. He could use his hands. He could make anything or do anything. In fact, he made the best lemon pie for me all the time. Uh, that's that's twice we've had twice the lemon, lemon pie, pie reference. He, he doesn't <clears throat> mention the chili that Mel used to make that he had a name for. What was the name of the chili? Inherit the wind. <laughs> I forgot that. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, but he all right, everything. now wait a minute, guys. I'm gonna have to slow you down we're because we're gonna track. have to wind some things up. Okay. And I want some instructions from you too. This is the letter from the Kansas City Library about storing our historical information. I am thrilled with this letter because for several reasons. One is that we are allowed to take our material out of the Missouri Valley Collection if we ever want to do that. That is not permitted in most archives because you give it to them and it becomes theirs. You lose all control, so we're not doing that here. So I'm just thrilled that we have this because at some point, I'm hoping that our community will have our own archives collection place. Because what you're telling me, can't you see what young people today would get out of your story? Can you see what it is? they would get out of that story? Have you ever heard of the book, The Outliers? Okay. My copy, uh, Laura has it. But an outlier is a person who is smart, works very hard, has the right mentors, attracts mentors, and has them respond and so on. And with that kind of a, uh, a situation, they will become successful. I want our younger generation to learn what you, your stories, so that they too, because otherwise they give up immediately. They run into a problem and it's all over. And I want you to tell them to do it differently and how you do it. Your story is, it's amazing. It's an amazing set of stories, not just one story, but set of stories. 
And I'm so glad we got to do this, but we're not finished. Because there's there's more to it than what you said. Now, all right, Crosby feels that with your information, with your history, people will get an idea about what the industry was all about. They will they will be able to share it and it will be available to them. That's the most important thing, that it will be accessible. And it will be accessible at the downtown library. The gal at Penn Valley wants that because she wants to take her students down there to read these doors. Alright, now some of it you may want not want them to read. Some of it you may want to seal. You have the right to do that. You have the right to be as exposed as you want and as you don't want. And that's the kind of arrangement we have with Crosby, and I'm thrilled with it. Uh, I, there are many archive setups in this country. In fact, oral histories has become a worldwide activity. On my computer, I have lists and lists and lists of places all over the world who are doing oral histories. They have come to this point having much different ideas about the, how things came to be. Now this um, tape that I'm going through, can we leave it with them to look at? Hey, it's yours. You can do it oh, with the, the DVD. Yeah. Um, it's a tremendous story. And wait a minute, I'm going to give you something else. Would you like to have some water? Coffee? Hey, except uh, what's the date of the phone book? 26. 26, 27. When I was born. We weren't around here then. No. Did you did you live in Bay Take City also? I lived in Chicago, Civil Way, in Bay City, Michigan. Yeah, right. We got together in, in Columbia, Missouri, Stevens College, University of Missouri. <laughs> Got together uh, in Michigan, Ann Arbor, Michigan. That that synergy between those two schools oh, Stevens lasted and, and for you, years. Yeah. Stevens because because I remember when I was looking, you know, at, at the colleges, you know, everybody said, "Man, go to MU. The girls outnumber the boys three to one." And Christian college, right? Another piece right. of history. Three to one. Oh, more than that. Four to one. Japanese so you take your pick. The second bond Did you go there? No. They came I went here. To a I, went I went to the School of Hard Knocks. I went to two years. Remember Ernie Pyle? I went to he was buried Missouri there. then the next two years. Uh -huh. but when they were going to go over to the USS Missouri, they flew their planes, planes and landed on Iowa. My Ishina. mom went to Paseo. Got out of she there graduated a few years after this. Well, got in when the RC-54 planes and they flew up to the USS Missouri. I was there. Uh, yeah, yeah. So great. A lot yeah. of people don't even They're know that. You're right. No. Four years. No, but that's uh -huh. the point. Uh -huh. You know, and that's a, there are holes in people's percent perspective mm -hmm. and that's what we want to accomplish. I did my uh, well, that, my I ski bum year in Steamboat Springs in 68 and 69. Yeah. What fun. Steamboat ago. Springs. <laughs> my son is a yeah I know. I Ted's been there for years. Oh, yeah. uh, uh, yes, is this Crosby? Yeah. Yeah. Cross well it's I can't go oh, better. And he likes to go. It was a great place to live. Still yeah. is. You can yeah. have it. It's small. No, I like Well, it was really it. small in 68 and 69. Yeah. <laughs> Who? Well, he went to Boulder. Oh. Yeah, he Sandy went to CU son. for school. Yeah, well, a good friend of Colorado it's, it's, it's yeah. baby's son. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I know, but it's a yeah, stepson. Yeah, yeah. Step Three grandkids went to yeah. Denver University. Mm. That's where my daughter's at. With Denver University? Yeah. 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 She's in grad school. The social work. My oldest brother. Oldest brother. She's an he MSW. Been, uh, hmm? 14 years older than me, in 97. He died in He was in Phi Beta Kappa, and 
I said, God, I had a Washington University. Yeah, he was a that. genius, but he was schizophrenic. And he uh, he was. You remember the name the name Bull Halsey? Sure, Admiral Bull Halsey. Uh -huh. My brother was on his ship with him as the chief, and he was in charge of epidemiology, bacteriology laboratory. Uh -huh. When they went into an island, he went in and made sure the water was right and everything. He was in the Navy six years. Were you in the Navy? No, I was in the Air Force. Oh, okay. And, uh, of course, my brother died at 54 years old. He had a massive heart attack, but he was schizophrenic. He ate himself to death. He was yeah, Phi Beta Kappa and Sigma Xi at Washington University. He had one year to be a doctor. Now, they just tell me this because he was so much older than me. One year to be a doctor. They kicked him out of school. He went to the hospital for a month and took his final exam, and they tell me he made straight A's on it. Never even cracked a book. You know, yeah. they're finding out now how so many Jews are so smart. There was an article what happened to me? in today's <laughs> paper, and it has to do with the fact that so many of us came from the same gene pool. And I'll, I'll find out where I read this and share it with you. I don't want them to take it away. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's fun being smart, isn't it? <laughs> Simple. You're, you, 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 have your, you have your master's in, uh, in social work? Yes. My daughter is getting her master's in social work at DU, at University of Denver. Fantastic. She's in her first year of grad school. It would be her senior year of college, but she finished her undergrad in three years. She's a little brain. Yeah. She's a hard worker. She's one of us. She's a hard worker. She's an outlier. She's a hard worker. <laughs> and she's doing a, um, an internship right now at a middle school helping kids for her internship. Taking 18 hours plus the internship. And she's in the a cappella group. There you go. Norman, you she's still so go to work every day, don't you? Here, there's, there's an example of what I always follow myself after him. 90-some years old, and he's not quite 10 years 91. old. 91. You, That's some, isn't it? You're not, <laughs> you're, I'll be 84, so we're... She's 87. I hire a professional driver. Good. Charge to the business. Good. But uh, that's why I come to work every day. I want to... I want to keep my brain going. I want to keep myself going. I go to work when I was uh, operated on in May, and I had to stay home about a month and a half, I thought I was going to go crazy. I didn't know what to do with myself. And the worst part of me is, I'm a bad reader. I've never read well in my life. Probably dyslexic. I am. How does you know that? I know a lot about dyslexic. I am. And I can read that article or whatever it is and you can ask me what it's about, I have no idea. But uh, I've been able, I did get trained from my brother how to use my hands, so that helped. When I got married in 1949, we bought a house on State Line where we had our kids, 75th and State Line. It's still there. Yeah, I built 44 feet on my house at night after I got through with work here. 44 feet you added to I it? I added to the back of the house, made an L shape out of those little wind row houses. I knew the house. God, that I, house is still there. Uh -huh. You know where the bank, bank is on the southwest corner? There's a right. bank at 75th and State Line. Right used to next be door is the house I was Country born in. Club. Really? Golf yeah. club. That was the That's house. That was the name of the property. What was the name of that golf club? Meadow Lake. That was Meadow Lake Golf Club. Yeah, that but was I belong there? now to Meadow Brook. Right. That's across the street from where I live. But that's my first house. I paid 10.8 for it, and I got a GI loan, uh, and uh, I had to have $300 for closing costs. So I had to go to my father-in-law and see if he'd loan me the money. Yeah. Did he? Yeah. Sure. We, we did that at 5612 Belinda, and uh, I went to her father-in-law for the money. <laughs> and we paid him back. Well, how long did you guys live at that house on Belinda? Because I used to come over there every now and then. Wow. 25 years. Well, because I went... Th <clears throat> this will blow your mind. Barbara. My Barbara. Your Barbara had a good friend named Kitsy Hyde. Oh, yeah, yes. She still does. We saw Kitsy the other day. Well, Kitsy and I were 
went steady in high school. She went so, with other guys too. So occasionally, <laughs> now I find out. <laughs> Forty-five years later, I find this out. Oh, she was very attractive. I know, but I did some video, uh, film to video transfer for you. Uh, of Barbara's 16th birthday party. You had it on Super 8 film, then we put it on VHS about 15, 20 years ago. And there were pictures of Kitsy in that. And I remember coming to that party. And I was told not to come to that party, but I showed up at that party anyway, because it was all girls that were there. It was funny. Anyway. When did you move out? When did you leave that house and move over to Ensley Lane? Oh, we moved to 2400 Drury Lane. Drury Lane. 72, I think it was, wasn't it? I sold the business in 72 and we moved in about 74. Okay. And 74 is the year I started here and I was picking up at your house there. <laughs> now, look. We're diverting, we're talking about us. It's, it's all part of history. No, I yes. can't help it. I am thinking <laughs> all the time people are talking about how this story is going to go to the next generation. And I want them, but I want to be sure that you're not exposed any more than you want to be. Okay? <laughs> That's all you want. <laughs> yeah, 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 we're, we're the oldest continuously owned dry cleaner in, you know, in, in, in Kansas City. Probably the oldest continuously owned business. Well, I don't know about that. Really? 95 years. No, there's, there's fourth generation businesses over 100 years old that are still in the same family. How old is Western Extra Light? How old is their business? Eisenberg's. Is that? Oh, I don't know. I know the two boys, and I knew. Er, are they, I knew are they a third generation? No, I don't think no. so. No, no sir. because I don't know. second They're... generation because uh, Ernie, yeah. uh, Ernie was from uh, Germany. He came over from the Holocaust, oh. and that he started the business. Oh, okay. now wait a minute. I well, could there, be wrong. It could have been his I'm dad sure too. Could have done it. I don't there, know. I'm sure there's some some older business, but. Dry cleaner wise, when Miller Cleaners went out, well, he was we became the oldest. Yeah, Leon Saper Miller. Saper was a, an old business. Right, he was a little longer than us too. But nobody, there's, anybody is alive still. Now I, my son is 24, but I haven't encouraged him. Where is he? He's uh, he's got his own business. He's uh, in merchant services, credit card processing. He's on his own or for a big company? He, he has um, the, the, the actual owner of the company is in Denver, uh, but Brad is, is an independent contractor. But I have a, a five-year rule. I, I told him that I want him to try and figure it out on his own uh, when he gets out of college and get some training and go to work for somebody and Get some experience Was it before. This is open to him five years. If after five years yeah. he still has an interest, we could talk. But an interest I, I, in in the business. business. This Why didn't business. you take on others? Why didn't you acquire more branches? Oh well, I I acquired other businesses. You know, no, we've we've acquired business. other businesses. There is a very good reason for that. That is part of the strategic plan. We, that's part of it. Part I of it is, is well, the, the question was, why didn't we, um, why didn't we shame. branch out into multiple locations? The, the biggest reason for that is because we're a wholesaler as well as a retailer. We do work for most of the other dry cleaners in Kansas City. And if I wanted Specialty to... Specialty work. I was getting to that. Uh, if I wanted to be a retail dry cleaner in the suburbs and get the best locations, then some of my best customers would be right across the street. And so then they would look at me as a competitor. That's why we stayed all these years, why we always stayed in, in retail, pick up and delivery to people's homes, and just this retail location at 39th and Troost, because we didn't want them to view us as competition. But there were certain cleaners that viewed us as competition anyway, um, and you know, and and for that reason, they they don't send us their specialty work. And specialty work is leather, fur, reweaving, 
um, uh, some special alterations, gown preservation. Uh, there's there's some chains of cleaners in in town that we do. We do their drapery work. We do down comforters for them. We do their wedding gowns. We do their leather. We do their fur. You know anything that comes in their door, fancy formal gowns that they're afraid to handle, they send to us, and we do it at a wholesale discount. So okay. let me interject. It's a big there. part of our business. There, one of the big reasons we never opened up another place because you can't find anybody that has any brains in this business to run it like this. We're running our business. You call up a store and you uh, and they answer the phone and they say, well, I have a piece of leather that you sent in that was damaged and you didn't write it on your ticket. He says, who is this? What, yeah, what that, do you that's, do? That's all about training. There, oh, there are nobody, some really good ones. Don't know such a bad story. You know about it's that, hard. don't oh. you? It's hard. Ask Sybil. Well, I mean, uh, there, she the, wouldn't quit me because nobody else can stand the, her. The most successful dry cleaners in the United States that have done multiple locations have well-trained, well-paid people in that store. Who and are happy for, to go to work every day. For many, many years, <laughs> the model for chains was uh, a package plant, what they called a package plant, which meant it was a small operating plant and you had a dry cleaner in that plant, a manager that was the dry cleaner that had all the expertise. And a customer could walk in and talk to the dry cleaner. And so those, those were the most successful locations. Then after uh, the mid-80s when all the environmental uh, problems started cropping up, cleaners started thinking, wow, we can't afford this liability to have all these package plants and have solvent you know, uh, problems and environmental liability. And, they, and then the landlord started, started finding all this environmental liability. And so then the model changed and they said, okay, now we want a big main plant, which is like what we have here. Yeah. And we want just the little agencies, or they call them dry stores. Dry meaning there's no equipment in there. There's no dry cleaning equipment. And so then the dry store model came up. And when the dry store model came up, they said, well, we got to see how cheap we can put a dry store in. And then how cheap can we staff it? Well, we're going to pay minimum wage to high school kids. That's the problem. Yeah. They had no expertise. Now, the ones that were really smart, when they started drying up their package plants and making them dry stores, they left the manager in there, the guy that had all the expertise or the lady that had all the expertise, and they were still successful even though they didn't have dry cleaning on the premises because they had the expertise in there. So that is, that. but, but we didn't, look, I came from a uh, an e myth entrepreneur that had all the, what, what the, the and uh, have you ever read the book the e myth? Yeah, by T. The e myth is is uh, yeah, is a, is the story about how people that have the know how to do things trying to start their own business, mm -hmm. but they don't have the know how of how to build a business and an organization and take that you know that know how and that business. To the next level, which which you you have to grow your your abilities, and so you know um, I read that book a long long time ago. There was another great book uh, that I read about taking uh, you know growing a business from you know the uh, a small family business to you know a, a bigger organization, and you know that's when you know I tried to hire middle management and start to train people and give responsibility mm -hmm. and you know so that that's the, the growing pains of that are very very difficult most businesses don't make it through that period of time right. they you know they implode and uh, you know so the, there's a lot of a lot of very important lessons in that uh, in that stage of growing but, but we went in 1974 stop. okay we're gonna stop at this point <clears throat> now do we know where we're going to start when we get together again well, we can... Or wouldn't you like to see the movie first? Sure. And then we can uh, decide. And I promised Laura that she would be involved, but I'll tell you what, else, what other good luck we have. I found someone to do all of our 
grant writing. And she used to be the director of the museum in Lawrence. And she isn't there anymore, but she is doing grant writing. She's going to do ours. And she's going to look at, uh, she wanted to be here today, but she couldn't be here. She lives in Lawrence. So we've got a lot of good things going for us. We've got Jessica doing the manuscripts. We've got uh, Andrea Norris doing our grants. We've got good people lined up for the stories. Your story, I don't, I wouldn't care if it went on forever because it is so entrepreneurial. And, um, something kids can learn. You know, some of the comments you've made about um, uh, middle... Management. Middle management. So those are, e those they can learn, but they don't get them in school. No, my, my son said he graduated from the Block Business School with a business degree. And uh, then he gets out and starts working in the real world. Uh -huh. And he said, they didn't teach me anything, Dad. They didn't teach me anything, you know, because he's out there finding out what it's really like to make a presentation to a customer and, and have, you know, objections and how do you answer those objections and, and what do you do when it doesn't work, you know, and, and so uh, I've been now, coaching him a lot. Now the difference is I got an MBA when I was 65. And it cost a lot of money, but and the company paid for that too. I wanted to know how I was successful, and it worked. But right. the kids in the class, I was a icon. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. Uh, well, yeah. I sold out Bill? to an international company. I still I want found Brad out what I wanted. to. I wanted Marvin's phone number. I still want Brad to yeah, go back it. for the executive MBA right program at, at UMKC. Uh, thanks for calling me back. Yeah, and, and, but they they have a requirement that you have to be you know out in the in the business world for at least two years, mm -hmm. and then you have to reapply. I don't know that he'll want to go back into academia at that point because how old is he? He's 24. No. He's 24. And he's a good kid. Lockers is a good school. Good kid. Like him. Yeah. He's working three jobs. You might know what kind of kid he is after he had a, an education. That's true. But the greatest education is when I came back from the service and I got in the cleaning business, I was 21 years old and I knew everything. I was smarter than hell. I used to go in and sell dry cleaning. I knew, had no more idea what it was all about than a man on the moon. But just over the years, the people that I hired that were drunks, that were good, were bad, I, I picked out everything that they knew good and forgot about the bad stuff. And when I went in and talked to somebody, they knew I knew what I was talking about. That's how I got into the suede and leather business. I was in uh, <clears throat> Dallas, Texas. I'll tell you real quick. Walked into a, uh, my wife had, was in a clothing uh, business and they took us with us. They made a little money and they took this other guy and me and we went to the market. And I walked into a leather place and uh, she, I told her what I did and I was in the leather business. I knew a lot about it. And she, uh, she said, how long you been? And I said, oh, I've been studying this for years. I didn't even know anything about it. So she gave me a chance, sent me a, a jacket and we did it by hand, uh, nothing like we do. And uh, I sent it back and she loved it. The name of the company was Begador Made in Israel. And later it was Begador Italia. To this day, the gal who, I, who ran the company in New York still sends us stuff. You know. I just talked to her two months ago. Yeah, and she thinks I am God. You are. And this is what I. This is what we tried Rudolph. to do. Leather cleaning guy. Z yeah. Ziva Rudolph. <laughs> Ziva yeah. Rudolph. Yeah. Beautiful gal. Yeah. All right, now we gotta stop, don't we? We yeah. gotta stop, and I hate to stop. Lots of stories, Dad. What? What year was that, Dad? Oh. Wait a minute. I still have a jacket that I cut up downstairs to use for something that I bought from her. What business was that? Mom was in with who? With, uh, uh, she just died. Uh, uh, oh, I know. Rosalie, who you're Rosalie, Rosalie Laner. Laner. Rosalie Laner. Yeah. Oh, sure. And what, <laughs> you know, what, what business was that? 
they uh, they were with uh, <clears throat> uh, they were over on Forty Seventh Street. Yeah. Right off of Jarbo. Yeah. Up there. What was the name of it though? It didn't last. Very Eighteen long. Carat was the jewelry part of it, right. and that was run by uh, uh, Greenberg, uh, Margie, Margie Greenberg, and somebody else. Barbara and Mother, Brown. Uh huh. I don't know who. And Mother was in the clothing part of it. Jeez. Well, I don't know what you're talking about. They had a little clothing store. Who? My wife and Rosalie Laner. And that's how I went to the they market in Dallas. So they were buying clothes. That's how I first met this lady, Ziva Rudolph. And from Ziva Rudolph, she told somebody else about me. I went to see them in New York. And what was that couple's name? Herrera? Oh, yeah. Uh, Arthur Cohen. Arthur Cohen and uh, Alicia, Herrera. Alicia Herrera. And they loved what I did. And I went, that was from one talk to another talk. And, to then, the, and then the next one was in transit. Yeah. And, and, and uh, he's in Florida now. Mm -hmm. I want to tell you what really company. helped though, the salesmen for the company, the sales guys, there was two or three of them, they quit and went someplace else and they told them about us. And then they quit there and some other salesmen told us about it. So that's how it happened. Polo, Polo Ralph Lauren, what was that, 1995? Uh, what 90, about Polo? 93. In 93, we did 450,000 pair of jeans. The, 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 this is, the, we'll have this to get is back the, to I this. Can, <laughs> more. Dan, I you know, skip, you I skip know, around I know, so much. I, well, I only remember what you, I can you, skip around. You skip around too All much. All right, now wait a minute. It's just um, too fast. The editor is going to have big problems, problems with this. Uh, well, I can, the, uh, the editor. having nightmares. <laughs> Why? <laughs> because it's so skipped around. That's okay. That's okay. I'll have to help with the genial with the with the uh, chron the chronology. Yeah. Because uh, it's uh, very skipped. I was in Okinawa. Thirteen. Okay, so I should stop tape now, Civil. In the Air Force. I'm afraid they're going to tell another story. No, no, we're done. <laughs> we're done. It's time to go. Dad's got to be somewhere. Right. We all did. They ended up in Seattle, Washington. Right. I started out in Lincoln, Nebraska. Then I went to uh, to uh, Ann oh, Arbor, Michigan. Was the boy you know, making the lady the from Texas? Yes, yes, yes. Said that. Yeah, I want to talk to you about your tell. service uh, history a That's little bit true. somewhere down the line. Sure. I got some things to tell you. I just told her about something. When I was on Okinawa, there was a little bitty island right next to Okinawa called Aishima. Really? Ernie yeah. Pyle was really? buried there. And, you remember the name Ernie Pyle? Uh, yeah, he was the uh, was journalist the who uh, got killed. The new Kaplan. The Japanese, yeah. after yeah. we dropped right. the second bomb, uh -huh. decided to quit and yeah. surrendered. Yeah. In so the conference they today. left Stephen and Alan? Tokyo yes. yeah. Stephen on an airplane, yeah. a bunch all of right. them with all the regalia on and everything. And, spoken and, to them? and landed I, on Aishima. And I was there. And I they got into a C-54 uh, and flew to the USS Missouri, Missouri to sign, right. to sign the and I was there, and I had four pictures that I had taken of these, and I took it to the VFW. I never heard another word for it, and when I went over to ask him about the uh, pictures, nobody knew about it. Somebody that. stole them. Huh? Yeah, and what I did think? not make copies of I, I, them. Think I was stupid. I was in there A lot of things. Well, you were 21, 20 years old, right? They're no, crying. later. That oh. was later. Their business is terrible. Okay. Well, what were you doing with the B-29? Yeah. So, I was a flight engineer. Poverty. Okay, so you flew... Uh, in, yeah, mid fuselage, or I mean, did, I, I think it's you had to run all of the. Since, front. Since, uh, so you had this uh, this giant uh, panel. No. Here, 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 the here is the pilot choice. and yeah. the pilot now, and the co-pilot. Right. To go find yeah. Here is the nice bombardier. Right. right. But they don't have. Here is the flight engineer with a panel right here. Right. So you you monitored the engines and when they when they pilot and everybody came in, I started all the engines. Yeah. I ran them up and got the temperatures right and everything had to be right before they take over. Yeah. And I could stop the flight if I wanted to and say this is not right. It's a But to digress a minute, before anything, when I left, basic training was going into the mechanic and I mean, when I go out of town, I worry about you know. We were going to go overseas, so they shipped me to Fort Wayne. I'm going to take yeah. this. Okay. And they were building uh, an airplane me, called the B-32 to copy the B-29. This one? This one? Yeah. Well, on the B-32, they had I've got a color copy, so you four, four, four engines, uh, the two inboard engines, 
were had Curtis Electric props on them that had were electric you know to turn the turn the prop to uh, yeah, feather. You know what oh yeah, yeah. To so change the pitch of the and, of the propellers. Uh, so when you yeah. flew in, they did the inboard the engines but not are pushed uh -huh. instead of pulled. Uh -huh. And I was the one that was one of the first group that did that. Yeah. And they, after that was all over with, they threw the plane away. It was no good. It didn't work. Yes, it worked. It did work. But the plane wasn't worth the crap. The name Every time you reverse the pitch on the props, the whole goddamn airplane was up. Oh, okay. So what happened is they put that on every I ship. Want that and too. look at the jets that now. They all have a reversal. Yeah, they all do reverse. And yeah. that's what stops the plane. Right. I was on the first copies. group of planes of that this. ever did that. And a lot of people didn't even know about it. Never heard of the B-32 I had to put Nobody this else. Consolidated for, Vault um, Build It. Oh, okay. You, uh, did you hear uh, the B-36? Yeah. That's where they made the B-36 in Fort Worth, Texas. So that I could acquire property to the north. Now, Consolidated, they were the same company that built the PBYs and and stuff like that out in San Diego. Let me, let me just explain to you. To, well, Boeing was another mm -hmm. company. Yeah. See, this is this Consolidated is the was animal. another company Literally. during the war. Yeah. yeah. That's the Who owned this Consolidated? Was the Hap Arnold. Well, there was a guy. Yeah. Hap anyway. Arnold. He was That's, the head of the Air Force. This is the original building here. And it was That's it, the it one was we business. added to it. You know, this was uh, just like business today. Yeah. The in military the industrial complex. And they were competition. All this. And they built all these airplanes. They dumped them in the trash. Condemnation. You know money, how much money is thrown away? No, oh, I don't even want to think about it. Authority. My dad worked at Lockheed during the war. Yeah, yeah, yeah Lockheed down in Long Beach. Uh huh. Long Beach. Yeah. P thirty eight. Yeah, he was the traffic manager. He shipped them. Yeah. yeah. When I was on Okinawa, we had a, a yeah, black back group I'm gonna, I'm gonna copy that this. flew P fifty one. Uh huh. We were up here on Kadena, and this was uh, Yana Baru was the name of the. God, how do I remember all that? Yana Baru was one of the uh, fighter. Uh huh. And Those were the Tuskegee Airmen, right? I the, think this was another group. Oh, okay. The Tuskegee was in Europe. Oh, okay. But they fl they flew P fifty ones as well. Sure, I know. Yeah. Well, Allison engines, yeah. inline, the greatest ship there was, P fifty one A's. Anyhow, they used to come in after a mission. They used to fly over the Kadena, the big strip, and they'd come in like this. And usually they'll turn around and land. Well, they they just come in like this, shh, whoosh, just like that. They were the greatest pilots you ever saw. Unbelievable. Never had on. style. Oh. <laughs> they were, they had, you've heard of 60 mission crush? Yeah. The hats? They had 90 mission crushes. Ooh. It was, it was, an, I got some stuff in my brain if I can just remember it. Okay, I'm hitting the stop button. Okay. <laughs>